Shitlord in the Anus of Madness. Written by Fabrina Glitchlace. Perhaps the rediscovery of our humanity and the potential of the human spirit which we have read about in legends of older civilizations or in accounts of solitary mystics or in tales of science fiction writers, perhaps this will constitute the true revolution of the future. The new frontier lies not beyond the planets, but within each one of us. Pierre Elliott Trudeau. This is a work of fiction. All of the characters, organizations, and events portrayed in this story are fictional or are used fictitiously. Shitlord in the Anus of Madness. Prologue. Civilization is a process whose purpose is to combine single human individuals, and after that families, then races, peoples, and nations, into one great unity, the unity of mankind. Sigmund Freud. In the not-too-distant future, globalization and corporate corruption of politicians leads to the acceleration of class conflicts. For a great many people, life is exceedingly shitty. Politics and diplomacy fail with increasing regularity. These crises precipitate change. Scientific breakthroughs and technological innovation step in to relieve the turmoil. A new world order is established. Civilization digests its new societal configuration quicker than ever before. Ready to emerge from within mankind is a lasting peace, unparalleled in the annals of time. Nature Calls Man creates culture and through culture creates himself. Pope John Paul II I awake, reverberated into consciousness, halfway through my sustained release of a massive fart. As the gas is expelled, my dream involving a soap opera starring Bill Shatner seeps back into the ether. Upon completion of my powerful blasting, I roll onto my back, open my eyes, and greet the light of a new day with a smile. I don't mind the smell. I welcome it. I've been constipated for almost a week. This morning's trumpeting is a harbinger of change. I'm happy for the first time in recent memory. Oh, womb-like warmth envelops me. Still smiling, I close my eyes, nuzzle my head into my pillow, and drift back to sleep. My name is Shia. I am almost 47 years old. I used to be a celebrity, a content creator, a real artist. But uh, nobody has been a fan of anything I have produced for a while. I'm not famous anymore. I'm, I am financially stable, and my investments ensure I won't have to work for the rest of my life. But I am deeply unsatisfied. I've been in steady decline, a prolonged personal fall from grace. With each passing day, my existential pain grows, fueled by periodic pangs of self-consciousness about my lack of creative output and status. Like all great artists do, I tried to become my art. I tried to be a force for good in the world. I tried to change minds. I tried to help people realize their potential for self-actualization. I tried to enable them to become, like me, the master of their own destiny, to not let their dreams be dreams. I tried my best to elevate consciousness, but instead I ended up exhausting my social capital, leaving sloppy personal messes in my wake, which could not be cleaned. I became unemployable, toxic. I was pushed out by those who had once accepted me. I was dumped, and now I hunger for the success that I once tasted. Last month, I rediscovered one of my many unpublished art projects. Started half a lifetime ago, the project involved several jars of my frozen feces, while not their intended purpose, I am now putting those turds to good use. I rehydrate them with one cup warm water mixed with one cup of apple and cinnamon oatmeal. Each morning for breakfast and each evening for dinner, I eat it. I have been enthusiastically ingesting it twice daily for a week. No one on earth finds the practice at all disgusting. Everyone is doing it. The product. Eat me. Lewis Carroll. One drunken night, almost a decade ago, I befriended a hobo who called himself Ognar. I was stumbling around Venice Beach when the old man sat up from between some bags and cardboard, startling me. For a split second, the derelict's wild, sparkling eyes locked with mine, and he shouted, We are all slaves. He was very weathered. He could have been anywhere between 50 and 90 years old. His hair was a matted skullet and there appeared to be granules of sand, or perhaps lice, in his unruly eyebrows. His complexion was pockmarked, oily, and uneven. He clearly had not bathed in a while, and at the time, nomming even a lower-tier product was certainly out of his price range, but apparently not outside his sphere of awareness. Despite his appearance and introduction, 
He ended up being surprisingly educated and eloquent. At some point in his past, he had been a somebody. He went on to tell me that advances in human civilization were always preceded by revolutions in science and technology. He said that the 19th century was fueled by chemistry, the 20th governed by physics, and our 21st century belonged to biology. He was drinking aqua velva while he said something like, It is a revolution about the nature of truth. And the truth about a revolution in nature. But first and foremost, it is a bowel movement. At the time, I had no idea what he might have been going on about. But today, I'd have to say that Dirty Bum was absolutely right. The groundwork was laid by cognitive neuroscience, evolutionary psychology, genome mapping, and epigenetic engineering. The tipping point was reached with the expanding of scientific knowledge about humanity's silent symbiotic partners, our gut bacteria. This came to be known as the microbiome revolution. The advancement of this field obsolesced large swaths of the social sciences. Human personalities, energy levels, moods, focus, body types, and even IQ were all linked to electrochemical feedback interactions with previously disregarded intestinal flora. Gut microbiota was discovered to be our brain's co-pilot in almost all variables affecting human lives. It was a discovery of scientific understanding, but the technology of the product wasn't exactly new. The product was a luxury secret passed back and forth for millennia exclusively between royal families, aristocracy, and other privileged individuals inhabiting the upper decks of human social strata. Marriages were arranged because of it. Agriculture developed to feed it. Exploration and colonization were inspired by it. Animals hunted to extinction to nourish it. Mergers and acquisitions were conducted to favor it. The product was the reason the laws of man never seemed to fully benefit all mankind. People who participated in the traditions didn't know why they did. To them, secretly eating shit was an ancient custom that just felt right. Well into the 21st century, regular use of the product resided in the realm of ridiculous rumor. The marketing and advertising never reached the general population. A rare few specialized doctors prescribed the product. A smattering of online video tutorials existed conducted by unconvincing, anonymous, low-talking nerds. Among the vast majority of humanity, the product remained either unknown or taboo. All throughout the 20th century was speculation about celebrity couples being unions of public relations and promotional convenience. And while that was true, it was not the primary purpose of such couplings, nor was genuine personal affection their motivation. The reason A-list celebrities like Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie partnered was simply because it was more economical than buying each other's product via middlemen. Becoming a couple was far less demanding than joining a crap collective like Scientology. As long as there has been civilization, there has existed a very lucrative market for upper crust guano. As use of the product gradually spread, the interests of the rich and famous aligned, uniting them with the same goals. Eventually, enough power was concentrated. Top-down changes could be efficiently forced to accelerate the bottom-up revolution. Due to a confluence of disparate technological progress and lax government regulations, near the end of the first quarter of the 21st century, the time was right for the product to be provided to the masses. The product initially gained popularity among the common people as an obscure hipster novelty provided by the company Soylent Brown Corporation. The first form to become widely available was marketed as polished turds. A week's supply consisting of seven quarter-sized beads, the entire package could fit in the palm of your hand. They were meant for ingestion, to be swallowed whole. They were sleek, glossy, and made of 100% pure human shit, a joke gift, quite often sitting at the back of a freezer, waiting. Until one day, curiosity or boredom got the better of the recipient, and the product was consumed. Those that tried it loved it and went on to proselytize its use without shame. Over a very short time, body types, capabilities, and psychometrics were leveled to that of the product's producer. The measurable physical and cognitive benefits caused an explosion of use. Subscribers to the product found themselves socially sorted out. Extroversion, openness, agreeableness, conscientiousness, neuroticism, all put into harmony. People were optimized. Individuals were no longer held back from being fully functional members of society. The secret was out. For the right price, one could regularly colonize their insides with the most successful, desired, and worshipped celebrity idle digestive bacteria. 
The initial disgust reaction was overpowered by the practical benefits. The taboo faded and use of the product was normalized. It became the most widespread and effective health and diet supplement fad ever. The product transformed society. Almost overnight, it became a signifier of style and status, very much like fashion. One could discern a lot about an individual based on the brand to which they subscribed and vice versa. People nomming the same brands tended to like similar things and even vote the same way. Jargon around use of the product evolved and informal slang like who ya nomin became almost as ubiquitous as hi, how are you? Soon there were people famous not for their talent, their fortune or anything they would do, but solely for their brand of premium product. Crapulence. The things we fear most in organizations, fluctuations, disturbances, imbalances, are the primary sources of creativity. Margaret J. Wheatley. My celebrity decline started much earlier, but accelerated with the rise of nomming. Since then, my dependence has grown. Nomming has become the one thing that makes me feel content with my life. For over a year now, my most pressing daily concern is to obtain the increasingly rare Annalise B 2031 premium product brand. It ceased production almost two years ago, superseded by inferior products AB 2032 and 2033. I have to buy second generation AB 2031 on the brown market. Such products are known as recycles. Third gen products are also available, but are not useful orally. My mom and Pop Nom too, they are quite old and the benefits to health and longevity are numerous. At the end of March, they moved from New York City to a beachfront retirement community in the Chinese province of Guangdong. My mother and I write to each other regularly, but despite living in the same city, I only saw them infrequently in recent years. I spent a weekend after they moved away, cleaning out their old midtown condo. Among the curios they opted to leave behind were my father's family trip souvenirs and my mother's display of the many trophies and awards I won when I was young. They told me in Hebrew my name meant gift of God. Being the only such gift divinely delivered to them, my parents have always been my number one and number two fans. The thought has crossed my mind I might never see them face to face again. I'm numb to the idea. I love my parents, but I do not miss them. I felt even less attachment to their mementos of me. I disposed of almost all of their things, almost, while cleaning out an old freezer I discovered some of my crap. Two dozen jars filled with 20-plus-year-old prime-of-my-life poop. So old... I can't remember the artistic purpose I originally intended for it, but I evidently created and cataloged quite a lot. Rather than dispose of it with the rest of my parents' refuse, I decided to keep it on ice. My thoughts did not return to it until weeks later when my regular source of preferred product dried up. And so at the start of Passover, on a whim, I began populating my microbiome using my own defrosted stool. I wasn't even sure that anything biologically active would have survived being frozen for over 20 years. But over the next week, it became apparent that it was working. Inside me, two colonies went to war. As the days passed, my body seemed to revolt. I felt as though I were undergoing a metamorphosis. I became lethargic. The constipation followed. My moods swung drastically. The cultures within me battled over resources. As the pain of constipation increased, my thoughts became clearer. My entire consciousness shifted. It was an uncomfortable feeling, but it was as though I were awakening for the first time in years. Without fresh reinforcements, the designer flora was soon in the minority. The microscopic companions from my youth asserted digestive dominance. Turbulent murk. The best way to make your dreams come true is to wake up. Paul Valerie. Disoriented, I find myself standing in front of a running faucet. I'm in a public washroom. An unkempt, bearded, middle-aged face is staring at me. Waving at him and forcing an awkward smile, I confirm the strange man peering at me is me. The reflection obeys my commands. I can't remember the last time I looked at myself. I look a lot like my father. When did that happen? My disorientation fades as I reestablish my personal narrative continuity. I'm carrying a shopping bag containing kale, quinoa, and gluten-free bagels. I must have decided to go shopping. I raise my arm to my face to consult my resist. The display indicates it is 11 a.m. April 20th. One week has passed since I started nomming my own product. Lapses in consciousness aren't completely unknown to me. I used to get blackout drunk in my youth. But this was different. 
Waking up while standing in public isn't something I'm used to. In recent years, I developed a distressing habit. I sit down for a meal, look down at my plate, and then realize I already finished it. I have no memory of eating, but I have the knowledge of having done it. Sometimes I start out walking a familiar route and then come to just as I arrive at my destination. My mind isn't wandering. Most of the time I am just zoned out, making decisions and completing relatively complex tasks on autopilot. Over the past week, fluctuations between these states have become more frequent, more random, and more powerful. Could it be that something about an upset stomach causes consciousness? Maybe it was the gas. The momentary eruptions, impossible to ignore, inflicting involuntary mindfulness. I'm at the onset of one of these punctuated conscious states. Why am I here? I'm not a fan of public washrooms. My belly churns to answer me, writhing as though filled with vindictive serpents. I turn around, enter a stall, drop trowel, and plop myself down on the porcelain. I begin to strain. I grunt. It isn't working. I try to relax. Looking up, I read the lone graffiti slogan scrawled on the side of the stall. It was a philosophical proclamation, or perhaps a proctological portent. When you're trying, as hard as you can, futilely stifling, the internal pressures of man, diarrhea, diarrhea. I never have had a critical ear for poetry, but this piece speaks to me. It somehow transcends its own juvenile jejun banality. It speaks to the opposite of my current predicament, but still seems poignant by way of juxtaposition. Chuckling at the synchronicity and the immaturity of it, I recall my seemingly indomitable childhood drives, my optimism, my ambition, my artistic spirit. Where did those parts of me go? When did I lose the spark? I used to get my illusion of meaning from doing work. To complement the work, an illusion of immortality came from pursuing sex. Those two key components in my buffet of life served to satiate my starving soul. My divorce was 15 years ago. I've neither had a job or an intimate relationship in a long time. And while I don't miss the activities, I miss the harmonious feeling that resulted from them in concert. The last few years of my life have been in general disarray, minimally conscious and filled with nothing. My youthful fecundity fermented into aged fetidity, Valuable time flushed away. Somewhere, somehow, I have matured into a man without a purpose. Was it Shakespeare who wrote, when you give up your dream, you die? I'm not sure, but by that metric, I must already be dead. I can't even remember what my dream was. I've become the ghost of a child. I am a living waste case. And then, a great release. At first, it is hard and painful, but... My sphincter relents, and a week's worth of filth bursts out of me. A mass comprised of billions of cellular casualties, refugees, and exiles of the war that was being waged within me. My negative thoughts similarly evacuated. I feel free fluid, floating atop a wave of positive energy, a mostly empty vessel. I am one with the universe. Almost gleefully, I press the reclamation button on the toilet. It starts humming like a dank espresso machine. The hairs on my arm stand on end. Strength surges through me. The mechanized vibrating stops. I open the receptacle and add the doggy bag to my grocery sack. I take one last look in the mirror before exiting the public restroom onto the corner of 46th and 7th. All the sights and sounds of the city aggressively assert themselves. Everything I see is ablaze with detail. Broadway is bustling, packed with people. None of them cast a shadow. High noon. Raising my hand to my brow and squinting to block out the excess illumination, I begin walking against the flow of the crowd. My butthole hurts, so I take slow, tiny steps. People zigzag around me. They avoid making eye contact, as is the custom in most major cities. Cars whoosh by to my right, tire friction emitting an audible tacking as the rubber rotates upon the pavement. Thorium engines gently whirring. Shoes of the crowd mutedly clack on the sidewalk. Delivery drones buzz about high above. I hear everything. My eyes adjust, and I look up. It had been a long time since I last looked up. Each side of the street lined with rows of buildings extending down to the horizon. New York City is the greatest city in the world. I feel dizzy and small. Looking at my feet to steady myself, I continue my slow walk forward. Below me, 
I hear the hissing sturm emanating from the subterranean bowels of the city. I feel a gentle April breeze pass between my fingers. My every nerve ending is fully alive, every sensation vital and robust. What is this state I'm experiencing? It's like a smell triggering youthful memories, only I feel it with all of my senses. It penetrates to the core of my existence. The state I am in feels familiar. It feels right. As I continue walking toward my hotel, my mind makes a connection. I feel like myself again. I am whole. It is sheer luck that I froze so much all those years ago, before I was even aware of the, the practice of nomming, before the, uh, the trend took off, before governments and religions jumped on the bandwagon and started with their own production. I didn't feel this way before I went indie. I wonder, could something have gone wrong? Old Habits. No man is free who is not master of himself. Epictetus. I enter my room and habitually boot up my telescreen. I'm bombarded by a news torrent. Short bits of information delivered by cartoon barnyard animals superficially inform me about world events. I've seen the one that is currently being broadcast before. It's about Moonbase Alpha. 65 years after man first set foot on the moon. Waypoint for man's further exploration of the solar system. Space colonies. Mankind will fulfill its destiny as a solar species. It's just 18 months away, I'm told. A cartoon chicken clucks, then speaks. Don't keep all your eggs in one basket. The scene changes to a surreal image of a giraffe floating in space. Its mouth opens, and an annoying transition tune plays, signifying the end of the 30-second piece and the start of the next. The next bit is something about cats and fungus. I change channels, tuning into the middle of a serial melodrama stream. Despite being irritated by such shows, I spend multiple hours a day watching them. The overwrought acting style is acceptable to me. It pays tribute to the historical progenitor of the art form, the telenovela. The thing that irks me is the bad editing. The ones my mother and I watched as a child were defined by long static shots, lingering close-ups, and slow zooms. Most viewers nowadays partake via virtual reality, and shows catering to that medium have risen in prominence. The camera angles and shots selected for the 2D versions are calculated by an algorithm based off of aggregate data of whatever the vert viewers were paying most attention to, a real-time focus group for every second. The automation of what was previously an art results in strange angles. The frequent, jarring, and repetitive cuts offends the visual grammar that I was raised to understand and appreciate. I miss the golden age of media when everything was available by choice and on demand. Media distribution in recent years has progressed to entirely streaming time slots. If a live stream is missed, it is not able to be viewed again until it is rebroadcast. It is inconvenient, but somewhat comforting to have an external order forced upon me. One less decision to make. Such regimented consumption times do nothing for programming quality though. I flip through channels, growing anxious, trying to find something to soothe and distract myself. With each successive failure, I feel as though invisible tentacles are reaching out from the screen, increasingly sapping my energy, draining me. 99% of everything is noise, useless flashing of sounds and colors, talking heads bobbling, a merry-go-round of overwhelming nonsense. Finger flicking the remote control on my racist, I zone out again. Hours pass. Consciousness returns. My face is sinking into the pressure of my sweating palms, blocking out the visuals overflowing from my telescreen. I'm exhausted. I haven't been sleeping. As I can recall the last several hours of shows, still, I have no memory of any conscious thoughts. How much time have I wasted just wondering things like, where Da movie's at? How much time do I spend passively binging? I am squandering my life. There is absolutely nothing of value streaming out of this virtual sewage pipe. How did I ever take comfort in this audio-visual barrage? A sudden anger rises up in me. Launching out of my chair to my feet, I shout, Screen off! The tech obeys. With the stream stopped, I begin to pace around the room, my heartbeat and thoughts racing as if to catch up for lost time. Anger intensifying. My mindfulness training kicks in. I step outside myself. This prolonged, agitated euphoria must be a symptom of withdrawal, possibly some form of paranoid psychosis. As alive as the anger makes me feel, as clear-headed and acutely aware, as manic and whole, 
I know through experience it is dangerous to entertain such impulses seriously. Irregular and intrusive thoughts like these have led me to numerous arrests in the past. I have experienced several phases of false enlightenment in my life, but never so strong and sustained a frisson as this. Suddenly, I crave a cigarette. Why? I haven't even thought about smoking for 10 years. My anger lets up and gives way to fear. Anxiety quickly consumes me. Scared on both a conscious and visceral level, I want nothing more than a return to normalcy. I need the comfort only numbing can provide me. I run downstairs and exit the hotel to the street. I must get some Annalise B. Puckery. There is a flickering spark in us all, which, if struck at just the right age can light the rest of our lives, elevating our ideals, deepening our tolerance, and sharpening our appetite for knowledge about the rest of the world. Educational and cultural exchanges provide a perfect opportunity for this precious spark to grow, making us more sensitive and wiser international citizens through our careers. Ronald Reagan I walk three miles from my hotel and down through Battery Park. With a goal in mind, I find myself focused, I know a guy who works at one of the Manhattan replication centers. This is where the various product brands are produced on an industrial scale to cater to the demands of growing consumer appetites. My dealer is Dr. Puckery, a commuter who lives somewhere in Jersey. I can't be sure if he is actually a doctor or if that is even his real name. Puckery charges a significant amount more than other illegal back alley dealers, but always has the best shit. Puckery, like me, exclusively noms Annalise B. I picked up off Puckery in the park a few times in the past. I know he will be catching the evening ferry after work. I arrive before rush hour. I'm early. God, it's a nice day. I sit cross-legged on a patch of grass overlooking the shore path. My eyes wander, scanning the pedestrians, looking for my hookup. I people watch. Shifting my focus from person to person, observing them going about their business... I imagine stories for their lives. I speculate on who they might be nomming, their resting faces roundly glowing, perfect complexions, suggesting a certain level of J-Law registered trademark, with perhaps a hint of bail registered trademark. All of them smile, but their bodies move as though they're not in any way enthused about completing whatever their daily tasks are. Something is automatic about their movements, facial expressions at odds with body language, I can't remember being conscious of my own resting face. I wonder aloud, is this what I look like? My perspective zooms out and I focus my attention on the crowd instead of the individuals. A few minutes elapse as hundreds of people pass by in both directions, flowing effortlessly, shuffling silently, like two dense flocks of birds gliding through each other. As disconcerting as it was to witness so many people's facial expressions not match their bodily movements, I'm more unsettled to realize their individual movements are perfectly coordinated to the group. It was gracefully fluid, but distressing like a completely liquid bowel movement. I recognize a face. It's puckery, but his expression is different from the other pedestrians. He wears an emotion I have not seen in years, an urgent perspiring distress, absolute panic, Puckery moves through the crowd at a speed greater than the rest, holding a black metallic briefcase to his chest. Unlike the majority he weaves around, Puckery is in quite the hurry. Captivated by the scene unfolding, I continue to observe. Puckery's pace picks up, scrambling toward the docks, frantically looking back over his shoulder. I follow his gaze, looking about half a mile down the shore. There they are, a six-person special cybernetic attack team, closing quickly. Puckery must have gotten himself in deep. Only the most deplorable domestic terrorists find themselves with scat bearing down on them. Puckery is heading toward the ferry. Scat is still far away, but they are likely going to catch up before he can board, let alone safely depart. Approaching the docks, he too appears to realize he is not going to make it. Puckery takes the case he is holding to his chest, and without breaking stride, ditches it beside a bench while continuing his dash. I know for my own good, it will be best to stay out of it but something in my gut tells me I should do something. I get up off the grass and walk slowly down to the path, clandestinely following approximately halfway between Puckery and Scat, walking in sync with the crowd, keeping a keen eye on Puckery from a safe distance. My attention turns from Puckery to his abandoned case. What could be inside? Something dangerous? A bomb? No, it had to be something valuable, something very valuable. 
The tantalizing tickles of curiosity and danger run up then down my spine, terminating at my taint. Puckery is now wildly sprinting toward the Jersey Ferry. I imagine Scat must be closing quickly, but do not turn to verify. Voices in my head are deliberating. Could Scat have seen Puckery drop the case? Dare I pick it up? I approach the bench. The thought bubbling within me becomes more frightening. No, I will not pick up the case. The decision is made. I will just keep walking. A thundering rush from behind and a blow to my shoulder spin me around and I fall. As though choreographed, I pirouette and fling myself into a seated position on the bench. As if fate, my right hand lands comfortably on the handle of the case. I watch in disbelief as the entire squad of heavily armed men charge by me, clad in brown suits, cybernetically augmented body armor, and clunking jackboots. Seconds pass while I sit watching several other pedestrians, similarly bold aside, slowly get up, unfazed. Still smiling, they dust themselves off and continue dawdling on their way, like nothing had happened. I continue sitting, suddenly realizing I am not breathing. I don't have the wind knocked out of me. My anxiety has returned. I remember my yoga training, force a deep breath, close my eyes, and start to meditate. The turbulent murk behind my eyelids dances and coalesces into globs of static, breaks apart, and fades. I'm sitting in a meadow. I breathe deeply. The smell of flowers, daffodils, maybe just dandelions. In the distance, running water, perhaps a babbling brook, birds chirping. A gentle breeze kisses my cheeks. Peace calm. Then a series of rapid gunfire blasts echo out. I open my eyes and bound to my feet. I take a few steps away from the bench and turn my head toward the origin of the sound, the docks. The rest of the crowd, also seemingly roused from another plane of consciousness, is on full alert. There is chatter and surprise. I can't see, but I know what must have happened. Looking down, I am shocked to find that my hand is tightly gripping the handle of Puckery's mysterious black case. It is lightweight, as though nearly empty. Evidently, my decision is made. Being mindful of my pace, not too fast, I turn and walk away. Monoculture. If we cannot now end our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. John F. Kennedy. I take my time getting home, snaking my way through the streets of New York, meandering an unfamiliar route back to my hotel. My paranoia rises steadily as the sun sets. Periodically, I peer over my shoulder to make sure I'm not being followed. My mind is prepared to toss the case that my hand is clutching at the first sign of trouble. I arrive at my hotel under cover of darkness. Avoiding the lobby, I take a side entrance, then the stairs up to my room. I chain the lock and bolt the door. Laying the case on my bed, I sit on the other side of the room and stare at it. I wait until I can no longer feel my heart beating in my chest. The blood rushing through my ears stops hissing. Calmed, I pop the lock with a bagel knife and open the case. Inside the case is a rye bread sandwich with lettuce and product spread, a small plastic container of apple slices, and a blue binder. Enclosed in the binder are several pages of graphs and charts comprising an internal report from Soylent Brown Corp. The report compares the most popular brands being nommed as of the end of Q1 2033. The technical documentation is above my head. I locate an executive summary among the pages describing a process calculated to complete within the next 18 months. The warning references a single figure, subsection H figure PJ9. The whole page is taken up by a fairly simple flowchart. There are three tiers. At the top are the two most expensive premium brands. Mid-level, the next four slightly less expensive but more popular products. The bottom level contains the remaining five most popular product brands. These 11 brands account for nearly 95% of product consumed worldwide. The chart labels them by their progenitor's name and vintage. Bi-directional arrows connect brands at each tier horizontally as well as vertically to the tiers directly above and below. Arrows from a couple of the bottom five brands loop back up directly to the top two. It looks like some kind of cycle. My preferred brand, Annalise B, occupies the second tier. Each of the 11 brands have a number below them, representing an M value. None of the numbers are below 85%. Most are above 95%. 
The summary indicates that every commercial brand currently being replicated by SBC differs at maximum by 15%, and the similarity between brands is increasing. They are all projected to be 98% similar within the year. The conclusion on the final page warned of Earth's human population attaining microbiota monoculture. In a year and a half, everyone on Earth will be nomming the same shit. Laying on my back, staring at the patterns in the stucco on the ceiling, I contemplate what this could mean. I might not understand the technical details, but I know an opportunity when I see it. I feel the tip of a plan begin to emerge from my mind sphincter. This information in combination with my newly rediscovered vintage, Shia 2012, will no doubt be the thing that will catapult me back into social relevance. I will provide this world a much-needed diversity. I will be hailed as a hero. Famous again at last. I composed for my mother a handwritten letter and drop it off with reception. The day had made me feel confused and adrift, but ended with me firmly sitting on a gold mine. I fall asleep happy. Business. We have war when at least one of the parties to a conflict wants something more than it wants peace. Gene D. Kirkpatrick. Morning comes and I awake elated. I mix some maple syrup into my sample labeled Shia 2012 08. Stirring thoroughly, I salivate in anticipation. I spread it generously on my morning bagel like a gourmet cream cheese. I still hate olives, but my taste tolerance for product has long since been acquired. This morning's breakfast nom stands out only in its texture. It is grainy and fibrous. The taste is a mellow, earthy dung. Not at all like the sweet, smooth logs with a hint of cinnamon I have grown accustomed to. As I chew, the mouthfeel isn't unpleasant. I'm unsure if the more solid particles popping in my mouth are artifacts in my product or are perhaps the sesame seeds on the bread. It doesn't matter. What matters is today I woke feeling confident and powerful. Once again, I have a purpose. As I swallow the last mouthful of my own shit, I feel not just full, but fulfilled. I shave for the first time in years, brush my teeth, put on an expensive suit, a stylish bow tie. I pack Puckery's case and exit my hotel room. Strutting, groomed, and garbed for success, I pass through the hotel lobby. I greet the concierge, a 20-something girl with a wide grin. You're positively glowing. Who you nomin? She inquires. I don't slow my stride or reply. I simply wink at her, eliciting an unconscious blush. I'm not completely socially bankrupt after all, almost 47 years old, and I still got it. I exit onto the street, assured in the path unfolding before me. My destination is SBC's replicator facility. I'm ready to do some business. My resting face is a smile the whole walk there. I exuberantly swing Puckery's case, broken lock securely affixed with a safety pin. My body language and facial expression in perfect harmony. I feel fully aware without fear or anxiety. My every physical sense simultaneously alert and at peace. I do not know what power sets my way, but my feet are set upon a road I must follow. The contents of the case are my golden ticket. I reach the factory, a plain-faced brick building, double-wide doors, buttressed with two decorative stone pillars. Above that, an awning emblazoned with the words Soylent Brown Corp. I enter through the front doors. I announce myself to reception, informing that I have found a case with some documents relating to monoculture and come offering a solution. Less than a minute passes, and a smiling business type slithers out to greet me. The slick individual spoke, Greetings and salutations. My name is Dr. Vegas, but friends like you can call me Lars. He beckons me beyond the waiting room into the world of business. Come with me, sir. We are absolutely elated that you came to us. Lars wears an argyle sweater vest. He is about average height, maybe a bit smaller than me, light blonde hair, bright blue eyes. He seems sharp, focused, albeit slightly off in a perturbingly penetrating way. Perhaps he's a lawyer, a nommer of Kruzkovich 2030, maybe both. Lars excitedly leads me down a hallway. The walls are lined with transparent windows providing views of several large empty conference rooms each room furnished with a single long table and about a dozen chairs. We pass the boardrooms and walk past a few unlabeled doors. Lars opens one and welcomes me into a smaller private office. The room has mahogany wood paneling and is styled as though it were a suburban family den circa the late 1970s. 
it clashes with the sterile hallway and open concept boardrooms, but it's cozy and I like it. Lars offers me a seat at the desk, motioning to a large antique brown leather chair. Circling around the office, he begins speaking. Can we get you anything? Green tea, coffee, a slice of red velvet on Elise. They have my number. Must have pulled my consumer file. Without hesitation, I reply, Green tea, yes please, and Annalise, that sounds magnificent, thanks. I sit in the chair, consciously maintaining my rigid businessy posture, but allowing myself to get comfortable. Lars presses a button on his resist. Bjorn, can we bring our guest a green tea and a serving of AB 2033? I lean in and whisper, 2031? Lars acknowledges with a wink and corrects, Make that AB 2031. Thank you, Bjorn. He flicks his wrist and reclines in his desk chair. Nodding his head and smiling wryly, he comments, Ah, yes, a gentleman of discerning taste. I smile and nod in return, quietly accepting the compliment. Lars begins speaking. I love my work. Here at SBC, we make the world a better place. He takes a deep breath. I recognize this is the start of a rote monologue. At first, replication and manufacture of the product was incomplete, synthetic, expensive. Only those with significant disposable income, privileged individuals of great wealth, could hope to afford it. However, increasing demand furthered the pace of innovation. Industrial replication of certain stool profiles created mass-produced replicas of the exact fiber, fat, protein, carb mixes and precise population ratios of the active biological cultures seeded from the genuine article. Our company post-ironically branded itself Soylent Brown Corporation. We developed and were first to market the breakthrough synth soil tech, indistinguishable from legit first-party humanure. We at Soylent Brown Corp. made numbing affordable. Lars drew another breath and continued, Shire, did you know that it wasn't so long ago that numbing was something that almost everyone not only frowned upon, but were absolutely disgusted by? I answer the rhetorical question. I barely remember. He seems like yesterday and the same time, a lifetime ago. Lars presses on. Yes, it's hard to believe how far we've come in such a short time. Attitudes and worldviews certainly have changed, and we at SBC are proud to have played a part in that. And I silently nod. Lars continues. The human disgust reaction to corpophagia was an oppressive social construct for far too long. To think that society and culture had almost universally bred such shame in mankind. Shame! For a perfectly natural impulse. Ridiculous. If dogs could talk, I'm sure they'd agree it was as natural an act as licking yourself clean. If someone said that to me a month ago, I might have affirmed the statement immediately. It sounds correct. But something about it stirs up memories of the version of me I was 20 years ago. I recall what I would have thought were I still that person. That person would not have been agreeable. I furrow my brow, remembering what my reaction would have been. Lars misinterprets my expression, adding, Shire, do you happen to know the history of analingus? He gave brief pause, but continued before an answer could be given. Ah, yes. Me neither. Secrets lost to time. But if our creators didn't want us tasting one another, then science tells us that nature wouldn't have evolved it to feel so rewarding. Don't you agree? I again nodded. He had a point. Lars resumed. Seven billion out of us, eight billion people. Nom daily. And the rest on an as-needed basis. And we're making inroads to accommodate those who, for logistics reasons, cannot afford to regularly supplement with product. A large blonde man of imposing stature enters the room carrying a tray with my tea and cake. Ah, oh, yes. Thank you, Bjorn, says Lars. Bjorn silently places the tray on, on the desk between Lars and I, then takes a seat behind me in the far corner of the office, just outside my periphery. I eye the ample slice of red velvet Annalise B, my mouth watering. I reach for the cake, but promptly remember the point of this meeting. I need to keep myself pure, nomming out of habit. Well, what a careless mistake that would be. Maintaining forward motion of my hand, I instead grab the tea, dump in a little almond milk, and begin stirring. I lean in. Thank you for your hospitality, but to get down to business, I am here because I believe I have something of great interest to SBC, and with your help, something to contribute to the entire world. 
Lars ceases reclining in his chair and sits upright. His monologue, whatever ending it might have had, abandoned. His engagement level changes to one of genuine interest. Ah, yes. Please, tell me more. I detect something else in his tone, something seething beneath his friendly exterior. Continuing, I say, I was uh, hoping you would be able to, I don't know, like uh, spin up or whatever the technical term is and like replicate my own brand to offer to people. Lars smiles and again reclines, not quite laughing, as though what he had just heard was somehow ridiculous. Shia, that's just not how we work. We satisfy a demand. We don't create it. Who would your product be for? Everyone already noms. People rarely combine brands and almost never do they switch. Lars stops, pauses briefly, then asks, Ah, yes. You haven't recently switched, have you? I've, uh... Thought about it, I answer, shifting in the suddenly uncomfortable leather chair, creating audible friction. Lars changes gears and seems to begin a different pitch. Not as robotic as the last, but still rehearsed. Shire, what and how people eat is valuable if not fascinating information. Food and the manner in which it is consumed can convey to observers the upbringing and heritage of the eater. The variety of rituals arising around something as mundane as eating can show one's economic class, education level, their compulsions, etc. The act of eating tells a history not just of the eater, but of their culture. Humans are cultural creatures, but their culture is firmly based in biology, and not just our own. I inform him, I've been to Paris, Tokyo, Rio, I've been all around the world. Mm-hmm. Well, a globe-totting man such as yourself would know it wasn't so long ago when people used to react to the cuisine of other cultures with almost the same disgust as they would have numbing. This unconscious emotional bias to even just the sight of another culture's food is at the core of what has driven human-on-human -human conflict. It, more than any other factor, is what used to distance us from our fellow men. I... Uh, I'm not sure what you're getting at, I conceded. It's really quite simple. The cohesion that a common diet brings, Fish Fridays, Taco Tuesdays, is what enabled civilization, such as it was, to occur. Our shared history of human advancement, however meager, is in many ways the history of the evolution of our appetites. Now conflicts, primarily driven by the unconscious and irrational effects of simple dietary differences. Oh, right, 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 but... Like, what about monoculture? Isn't that a problem? I ask. Lars stops and leans forward again. For a brief moment, his calm gives way, and his perpetually smiling exterior flashes frustration before being replaced by an even wider, disturbing grin. Ah, yes, I see you've read the erroneous reports. He enunciates as though he is squeezing the words through his teeth. I reply honestly. Yeah, well, yeah. I tried to. I would have had my agent or father handle this business for me if they were available. You know, it, it's like a too technical. Most of it is beyond me. But I do understand that the report seemed to be a warning. That report is dangerous and misleading information. Lars gradually raised his voice, half enthusiasm for the subject and half scoldingly. By stabilizing the microbiome and every behavioral and cognitive trait influenced by it, We've attained socio-moral equilibrium. We have set a universal baseline consumptive product and normalized it. Because of numbing, we have prioritized and are close to solving all of mankind's problems. Monoculture isn't something to be warned of or impeded in any way. It's the apex of our cultural evolution. It is the end of the history of man's conflict with man. It is our goal. Ah, uh, but I attempt to interject, failing as Lars presses on. We've cured asthma, diabetes, IBS, obesity, erectile dysfunction. We've eliminated most mental illnesses. People are healthy. The proper microbe community reduces inflammation, which prevents depression and cancers. The average lifespan for our generation is expected to exceed 105 high-quality years. We've implemented a universal basic income. Borders are open. Poverty, drug addiction, homelessness, violent crime. All a thing of the past. Microaggressions are non-existent. Do you realize how significant this is? 
It's almost May, and there hasn't been a single murder in New York City this year. Not a single one! I know the statistics to be true. The violent death of puckery comes to my mind, but I dare not mention that. Besides, I am not quite sure if murder is the right word for whatever transpired there. Puckery surely transgressed in some way to deserve his fate. And despite the distinctive sound of gunfire, I didn't stick around for confirmation. For all I know, Puckery might not even be dead. Realizing Lars is waiting for an answer, I say, Yes, the progress in recent years is impressive. It's more than merely impressive. We will have a fully functional and self-sufficient moon base within the next two years. From there, Mars. Freaking Mars, man! We will colonize the solar system. Mankind is making strides inconceivable to previous generations, he said. I understand all that. You want to preserve peace and help people. I'm progressive. I'm totally on board with that. I am not the type to want to divide people, but I feel my brand could be better, and if not, at least it'll offer variety. Don't people deserve to make a choice? I asked. Lars is taken aback and mutters as if questioning himself. Ch choice We must be far off his script. He glares silently at me for several seconds. Following up his tone shifts, he sternly suggests, Shire, tell me about how you've been feeling lately. Suddenly it is less like a business meeting and more like I'm being psychoanalyzed. I slump down slightly in the chair. My business posture deflates. This is not going as planned. I lie to myself with cliché. I don't really have a plan. It's more like an idea. A bad idea. I answer, I've been feeling like pretty okay, I guess. Out of the corner of my eye, I see the bulky Bjorn get up from his seat and assume a standing position akimbo the office door. You haven't touched your cake. Eat your cake, sneered Lars. Ah, yes, I say as I pull the plate of cake toward me, licking my lips. I pick up the fork. Lars' facade of pleasantry returns. He smiles and says, For being a thoughtful and good citizen, returning these harmful documents to us, we will reward you and your family with whatever product brands you desire for as long as you live. That sounds like a good deal, but it is not what I really want. Have I morphed into a mere background character in someone else's narrative? Anger boils up from my belly. Do they think me some kind of automaton? A zombie with no will of his own? Why do they expect me to just go along? As polite as the offer sounds, its tone screams, Just do what you're fucking told! In my youth, such tone never worked on me. I would almost always do the opposite. And with that thought, I recall what it was that motivated me in my formative years. My most powerful driving force, my muse, my spark, uh, was my spite. Taunting with calculated aloofness, I say, well, um, harmful documents. Oh, the reports. I didn't bring those. They're in a safe place. This case, it, it's packed with my product. Lars reads my defiance clearly. Well, that's distressing, he said. Maintaining his smile, he sighs deeply, then asks, Shia, have you considered that you may be suffering from DP? I don't know what DP is, but I know this Lars guy is being a real shithead. I match his smile and state, No, I uh, hadn't considered that. Ah, yes. Well, uh, in addition to the lifetime supply, we will provide you any treatment for dementia pugilistica you may need. How does that sound? He said, expanding the offer. Nodding while stroking my freshly sculpted goatee with my right hand, I make sure to use my expert acting skills to exude the appearance of deep thought. However, only one thing angrily echoes in my mind over and over. I made a mistake, a big goddamn mistake. To prevent situations like this, my old psychologist taught me to take the time in every decision to ask myself, what would I do if I were smarter? In circumstances where I remembered to ask, it usually worked. I was too excited and impulsive to remember the trick this time. Lars, filling the silence, offered a factoid. What we think of as our insides, our digestive tract, is actually the outside of our bodies. Mouth to anus. The inner ring of a mammalian muscular skeletal flesh bagel. I never thought about it like that. I pick up the plate of Red Velvet Annalise B. Registered Trademark 2031 and grasp the accompanying fork between my thumb and forefinger. I gently apply pressure to cut down through the gold-flecked white icing, revealing its sweet, fluffy, royal burgundy inner layers. It looks divine. I can smell the flavors. Lars notices my inhalation and goes off with a speech again. 
Ah, yes, the perfect mix of sugars, spices, amino acids, and oils. The preservative isopental pyrophosphate terostilbenes enclosing the bacterial seed colonies sublimate as the slice approaches room temperature. It will become teeming with active culture once your body heat and digestive enzymes accelerate the process. This consumable product is at once ancient and the pinnacle of science. It will provide me warmth, comfort, belonging, and calm. Lars jumps back into his spiel. We flesh donuts. Our digestive sides, not the inside, just the dark side of every human. Through this sensitive, semi-permeable membrane, we absorb all life-giving dietary nutrients. Without the microbiota that colonize these Stygian, non-Euclidean spaces within us, we cannot subsist. In a way, it is microbes that invented mammals. An eternal mind inside everyone. Mankind. Created to serve God. Having evidently completed his fucking weird speech, Lars stares at me. I can feel Bjorn's eyes on me, too. They want me to eat. They are waiting for me to eat. I impale a mouth-sized portion of cake, raise the fork to my lips, then lock eyes with Lars. I give him just enough time to realize this transaction is not going to be as easy as he thinks. I surge forward, reaching across the desk, and mash the plate of cake into Lars's wide-eyed, unblinking face. The towering Bjorn advances on me. I grab the case sitting on the desk and in one smooth motion stand up swinging it. I land the hard edge of the case squarely on the side of Bjorn's head. I flip the fork in my right hand, grasping it tightly in my fist and plunge it as hard as I can into Bjorn's left knee. He squeals as he falls to the ground, no longer obstructing my exit. With both men disabled by my unexpected attacks, I flee back into the hallway. I am unlikely to make it out the same way I came in. I run deeper into the facility, following the guidelines on the floor. The office block area exits into a dimly lit three-story open warehouse filled with pallets of product. Century-old brick and steel corrugated loading dock doors to the left, same to my right. An electronic alarm sounds. I have to get out of here. I run toward the back of the warehouse, toss my case up onto a barricaded metal stairs, and hoist myself over the railing. I ascend two stories to an internal scaffolding, and a platform suspended from the ceiling. I quickly run the length of the gangway to a door on the other side of the warehouse. I step through the door and close it behind me. Breathing heavily, I am immediately assaulted with the smell. Soiled. Nothing prevents us from being natural so much as the desire to appear so. Francois de la Rochefoucauld. My reality is a foul with horror, the horror of that smell, a stench that soils my soul. It saturates. But worse than the smell is the scene that my mind beholds. On the factory floor below me, bathed in the low flicker of unflattering fluorescent lighting, is row after row after row, hundreds of gigantic gelatinous masses. Reluctantly, I comprehend them as being human, an enormous collection of the morbidly obese, intubated through cranial orifices, each of them easily in excess of 800 pounds. Their translucent skin is pale, lumpy, and waxy. Above and between the rows, several large vats supplying tubes which descend into gaping maws. Each vat, tapped by ten pipes, supplying an equivalent number of the vaguely humanoid blobs with feed. And below them, industrial reclamation bins, collecting the product of what must be their almost nonstop power defecation. My God, what fresh hell is this? I cough aloud. I immediately regret my next inhale. Physically paralyzed by an impossible stink, my mind works to connect the dots. One of the documents in Puckery's case outlined the process to which I now found myself a first-hand witness. In the document, the people I see were just circles labeled Replicator 1 through 1600. I had assumed it industrial machinery. But these replicators are no machines. These poopers are people. A sickness stings me. A revulsion... More acute than disgust, what I now take in is not something I've been enculturated to hate. It is heretofore inconceivable to my mind, a conscious judgment. Surely whatever this is, is pure evil. The replication factory is supposed to be clean, wholesome. But this, 
This is not right. This process takes unnatural to another level. It made the dozen or so times I had to resort to freezing logs of third-generation product to insert into my ass like a frosty doo-doo dildo seem as right as pumpkin pie at Thanksgiving. The cacophony of the vast room full of glugging gullets and sputtering anuses is stupefying. It's like a never-ending sloppy, wet excretion coming from all directions at once. A dubstep concert, comprised entirely of samples designed to evoke existential anal dread. The sound of the facility is as though a flatulent collective is telepathically bathing in my stream of consciousness. <laughs> I fall to my knees, retching. Regret wells up within me, my eyes tearing from the stink, but also because of my grave miscalculation. I should have let the case be. Puckery paid the ultimate price trying to get away with it. It made sense that bringing it back with a solution to the problem would be welcome. Why didn't I consider that monoculture might be something the company desired? A global populace with the same microbiota a key component in determining the mind's range of possible expression, a limiting function on the ability to exhibit free will. In between the chorus of gaseous ripping, buzzwords from marketing materials filled my head. Dopamine and cortisol, precisely controlled. Individual temperaments, emotions, energy, and attention levels, all in sync. It all made a filthy sort of sense. The whole world united, satiated, easier to predict, easier to rule, Humanity had become a mere substrate, morphed into a background character in another life form's narrative. I get up, pressing onward, running the length of the hellscape, passing above the herd of replicators. My foot grazes a tray of rusty bolts, causing them to rain down upon the replicator directly below me. I watch as the projectiles impact on the pale goose flesh torso of the behemoth, sending gentle ripples through its copious subdermal fat deposits. The creature's doughy arms become animated, blindly seeking to itch the areas of impact upon its bare, bloated body. Its vestigial limbs, no longer useful, inarticulately flap around and ultimately fail to find the cause of the itch. It slips its head out of its vert helmet, revealing its porcine, yet decidedly human face. The yellowish whites of its eyes flick back and forth, scanning the visible portion of its substantial bulk for the source of its unexpected sensory input. It finds nothing and after a few seconds makes a chuffling sound and gives up. It slides its meaty head back into its tech. Were they employees, surely no one would willfully opt for such an existence. Chugging away on pablum, slaves, sucking down a slimy chemical slurry, bodies deformed and mutated. Homeostatic gastrointestinal tracts utilized to create unnatural amounts of perfect waste product. I throw up into my mouth. The odie taste of breakfast dung and the sour singe of stomach acid. I chew it back and swallow hard as I climb a ladder and open a hatch to the building's roof. I emerge into daylight, vision nearly blinded by mid-morning sun, olfactory relieved as I deeply breathe in the fresh air. I run to the west side of the roof and descend a fire escape into the alley. I dust myself off, adjust my bow tie, and as calmly as possible walk out of the alleyway into the street. At the front of the building, a couple of scat vans skid to a halt. Twelve troopers pile out of the vehicles. One squad of six storms into the front offices. The other comes toward me. I freeze, staring at their quickly advancing synchronous march. Stomping right past me, they turn into the alley I exited only seconds prior. They were definitely there for me, but must not yet have a description. I reanimate my fear-locked legs and begin walking. I will be pursued. I cannot go home again. I walk away from the SBC building, graduating to a gentle trot and exploding into a full sprint by the time I'm a block away. Raw, blood-rushing self-preservation instinct telling me to get far, far away. I run. I was always a good runner. Feet pounding pavement rhythmically, carrying me southbound. My body works and my mind goes elsewhere. I'm sitting with my mother in front of the TV. We're watching Star Trek together. I am a fan of the utopian ideal envisioned in the next generation. A future where most people work for their own pleasure and self-improvement. A great many of them do so while wearing onesies. Humanity has transcended its inefficiencies, conquered, and limited its entropy production. Evolved to dine on synthetic foods comprised of pure energy. Mankind no longer needs to generate excrement. This is a future without advertising, without capitalism, and most notably without toilets.
Liberty. Freedom is the permanent hope of mankind, the hunger in dark places, the longing of the soul. When our founders declared a new order of the ages, when soldiers died in wave upon wave for a union based on liberty, when citizens marched in peaceful outrage under the banner, Freedom Now, they were acting on an ancient hope that is meant to be fulfilled. George W. Bush. I regain consciousness approaching Battery Park. My body aches. I am drenched in sweat. An hour must have passed. As I enter the north side of the park, I hear scat sirens closing in the distance. I can see the docks and a ferry christened Miss New Jersey 2 boarding. I reach the waterfront and stand in the boarding line, waiting and sweating as the scat sirens get louder. There must be a way to fix this. I need to set things right. My mind goes to work imagining impossible scenarios. I am still in shock about my unspeakable peak beneath the closed lid of my society, my adrenaline pumping nonstop since my assault on those SBC assholes. I board the ferry and walk up to the second deck. I slump down in a seat and stow the case snugly between my feet. The ferry departs and I sigh with relief. Here I sit, broken-hearted. The enormity of the events of the morning congeal into a tangible experience. I think I might have just ruined my life. I still feel like I did the right thing, righteous even, but part of me knows I will not be on the right side of history. People who stand against progress are the enemies of civilization. If only I ran the idea past my agent, my father, or one of my millionaire lawyers. I scold myself for my epic failure. You've turned your good luck into shit yet again. The person to my left looks away, gets up, and takes a seat at the other side of the ferry. Embarrassed by my audible outburst, I clear my throat in a weak act of subterfuge. I need to get some distance between me and this mess. Maybe I'll visit my parents. Maybe I'll retire to the countryside, start an organic commune, get back to nature. Maybe the world is fine, and maybe my discontent is the problem. Who am I to want to change a world with which everyone else has no problem? But no, I'm deluding myself. I am afraid of having to do what I know I must. Knowledge like this cannot be unlearned, forgotten, or erased. I cannot neglect it. If my life is to mean anything, I will have to follow through. I take off my bow tie and loosen my collar. It's time for me to shit or get off the pot. Telling the world the truth is my duty. The sky above the port is the color of a turd bleached by the sun. Evenly overcast, a desaturated, dreary, but dry, off-white. As the distance between me and Manhattan increases, I notice that the ferry isn't headed to New Jersey. I rush to the bow of the ship, noting my courses to Liberty Island. I boarded a tourist boat. I curse myself for yet another mistake. Fuck! Maybe this could work out in my favor. Surely they won't expect me to go sightseeing. I again feel relief. I continue to watch the gently rolling sky above the city. The sun, somewhere slightly southeast, obscured by clouds. Something in the distance catches my eye. An attack helicopter. Somehow I know it is coming for me. But how did they find me? Maybe it was a security camera. Maybe I was tracked by the automated transit debit. Or the GPS in my communicator. Damn it, Shia! I scold myself, unstrapping my racist and promptly throwing it overboard. I watch it disappear beneath the waves. Too little, too late. The ferry arrives at the island. That helicopter is definitely coming this direction, not more than a minute away. I disembark with a group of tourists. What will my next move be? Keeping my head down, I walk slowly with a group off the dock and down a path, past a museum entrance. I eye some trees surrounding a large flagpole plaza that could perhaps give me some cover. Maybe if no one is looking, I could climb one and hide in its branches until this all blows over. The helicopter reaches the island. Above me, its rotating blades resonate, and it descends into the plaza clearing ahead. I continue walking toward it as a squad of scat disembarks, breaks into three groups of two, and spreads out. By now, they would have my description. I take off my suit jacket, deposit it into a nearby trash bin, and change my course as nonchalantly as possible. Breaking from the group of tourists, I walk away from the clearing along a tree line leading toward the base of the statue. I approach a large crowd in a line leading up to the turnstiles at the entrance to the building at the base of the statue. A command booms out. Halt. The electronically amplified voice startles me and the members of the crowd. I turn my head to see a pair of troopers closing. I am the only one in the crowd that didn't immediately come to a stop. 
I bump into someone standing in queue, stumble, trip, and fall. I watch as the case slips from my grasp, bounces once, and pops open, spilling its contents out. For a moment, I am surprised the blue folder is not inside. I recall mailing it to my mother. Instead of the case's original contents, a bag of ice and two dozen mason jars meticulously labeled Shia 2012.06 through Shia 2014.03 spill onto the pavement. My guts twist into a heavy void of despair. I watch as my best years roll away from me and clinkingly disappear into a forest of tourist legs. A few feet away, a small child picks up what looks like an October and examines the jar. She must be about six or seven years old. This kid is curious. She is not frozen in obedience to the halt command like the rest of the crowd. She makes eye contact with me. As calmly and clearly and kindly as I could, I whisper to the girl, That's yours now. Hide it. Keep it safe. It's special. I get up, turn, and lunge forward into the crowd. But I'm stopped by the metal railing of a turnstile. I feel a fiery pain. And then I hear the shots ring out. My guts hurt. I see my blood and breakfast explosively spackle across the faces of the tourist family in front of me. I look down at where my stomach used to be and see a fountain of red. I'm hit. I fall to my knees, clutching at my painful new orifice. The sun has come out from behind the clouds, yet I am firmly within the shadow of the statue. The crowd disperses away from me. I can't see scat approaching, but the oppressive lockstep clunking of their boots draws nearer. The crowd is still within earshot. I cough excruciatingly and a smattering of blood and brown sludge coats my lower lip and drips into my goatee. This is it. My life flashes before my eyes. All I can think is, who edited this shit? I know my story is coming to an end. I hold the gushing exit wound in my abdomen with my left hand. Raising my right fist into the air, I shake it in angry desolation. I peer upward full view of the backside of Lady Liberty and deeply draw my last breath. I am fading fast, but find time to pause for a second, hoping something better comes to mind. But it does not. I grunt and loudly excrete my legacy, my final warning to mankind. Soylent Brown is made by Poople! The End <laughs>